you. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to see you all in attendance. I will say I've been looking forward to today's guest and I hope listening to her, you will take something away that resonates, inspires, or empowers you. With any further ado, it is great honor to introduce Mrs. Kaya Robinson. She's a former commissioner for the National Inquiry into the Murder and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. Mrs. Kaya Robinson is a graduate of the, please see with me. <laughs> a Kitsurak. Kitsurak Law Program, a partnership between the University of Victoria and Nunavut Arctic College. Born in Yukulut, and raised in Igalulik, Commissioner Robinson is a strong Northern advocate who is fluent in Inukutut and in English. Yeah. She, artic she articled at, ooh, this is a long one. <laughs> um, just go Nunavut Legal Aid. Okay, Nunavut Legal Aid. Clerked with judges of the Nunavut Court of Justice under then Chief Justice Madam Justice Beverly Brown and then became a Crown Prosecutor who worked the Circuit Court in Nunavut for four years. Prior to her appointment as, Comminish, as Comminish, Commissioner, Robinson was an associate with Borden Ladner Javas LLP in Ottawa, Ontario, where she worked on Team North, a multidisciplinary team of 70 lawyers who do a variety of work throughout the northern parts of the prov provinces and in territories. Mrs. Robinson has worked on a wide range of issues affecting Indigenous rights. Most recently, she worked as legal counsel at the Specific Claims Tribunal mm -hmm. traveling to First Nations communities across Canada. In addition, Commissioner Robinson was a member of the Board of Directors of Tukisvavik Inuit, a not-for-profit not organization dedicated to providing cultural and wellness programs Inuit in Ottawa. Thank you, Kaya, for being, well, for joining us um, this morning. Um, so our first question will um, come from Blessed Sacrament School, which is in Vancouver. You were born, you were born in Iqaluit and you have a deep love for Nunavut. Can you tell us, can you tell our students about the epic journey involved in the creation of Nunavut? You, you, you have you had the opportunity of meeting with some of the great people who made the creation of Nunavut possible? That's an awesome question. I'm gonna first thank you so much for having me. This is really, really cool. Um, and uh, I know this is rescheduled from another time and thank you guys so much for your patience. Um, it's been a bit of a journey the last couple of months, but I'm so happy to be here. And thank you so much for your question. Um, so, yeah, I was born and raised in Nunavut. And my journey getting to Nunavut was pretty unique, too. Um, my parents are both non-Inuit, non-Indigenous. My father was a teacher. And I was born there. Um, at first, they named me Evelyn. Um, and then a couple of days after I was born, an elder in my community, Tatika, went to visit my parents and in Inuit culture told them, uh, well, shared with them that she believed that my name was Kaya, which was her late brother's name. And in Inuit culture, um, it's not really reincarnation, but you keep relationships in this and the spirits and the connections with people by giving next generations um, their names. So when she said I was named Kaya, that became it. <laughs> there was no <laughs> arguing with her. And that really defined um, a lot of my relationships. And um, because 
the m m person I was named after was Inuk and spoke Inuktitut. Everybody spoke to me in Inuktitut as a little kid. So that's how I learned the language. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really lucky as a non-Indigenous person to have been able to grow up in that culture and to be exposed to the language and to be able to speak. So I was a kid um, when Nunavut was a dream. And really the dream of Nunavut was to have a territory where Inuit, the Indigenous people of the land, played more of a role in the decision making that went into the government. Before Nunavut, Inuit were really the minority. And a lot of the decisions that were made for Nunavut were made in Yellowknife, which is like thousands of miles west, or in Ottawa, which is thousands of miles south, in totally, completely different climates and cultures and with different priorities. So Inuit fought really hard for two things, the Nunavut land claim agreement, and part of that agreement, which recognized Inuit rights, also was the promise to make a new public government, a new territory, and that's Nunavut, which then allowed Inuit to be more of a majority and play a bigger role uh, in the decision-making. Nunavut is a small territory. There's, I think, about 36,000 people. So you know kind of everybody. So I have had um, the tremendous opportunity to work with and meet the different leaders who negotiated the agreements, who played a really key role in uh, creating Nunavut, but also continuing to create Nunavut. Um, it is a young territory. Uh, you know, BC is like a long, like has been a public government and a province for a long time, Nunavut is still very young. Um, um, a great journey doing the type of work that I do because it's really connected to um, how the new territory runs, but in a way that elevates and advances and um, supports indigenous people and the people of, of the land and the territory. Hello again. Hi, Vivian. You were a board member of Tungasu Vingat in Inuit. Yep. Can you tell us about your time serving with them and about their mission? Absolutely. So I'm actually back on the board. So when I became a commissioner uh, for the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women Inquiry, I had to step away. But now that that role is done, I'm back on the board. Um, and for the mission, it's the key is in the name, but you have to speak the language. So Dungasugvingat means a place where you welcome, a place where you, you come together. And what Dungasugvingat Inuit, what we aim to do here in Ottawa and the national capital region, is to create a space where Inuit can come together, Inuit can access different resources that are specifically for Inuit. So language programs, cultural programs. Um, we also provide services to help people, Inuit people in the city uh, get housing, um, to secure training and jobs. And we also run a healing center um, for, for particularly for women who have experienced a lot of trauma and who are dealing with addictions. Um, we do a lot, but it's a, 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 a organization that is really trying to provide services to Inuit in Ottawa, um, because there's a lot of Inuit in Ottawa, which is a surprise, right? Because I'm sure you guys have learned in your classes that where is Inuit homeland? It's usually above the tree line in the northern parts of the country. But because of for lots of different reasons, a lot of Inuit have had to move to the city because there's not a lot of jobs up north, there's not a lot of housing, there's not a lot of educational opportunities. Uh, so they come down here. And when you come down here to Ottawa, sometimes it's very lonely, very scary. Um, 
and so that's what Inuit Tunga uh, Sukbinga Inuit was designed to do like 30 years ago it was established and that's what we try to do to provide services and community and support for for Inuit in the city. Hey that's pretty awesome. Um, so we also have what two questions from Cloverdale Catholic School. The main purpose today is to discuss murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. This is a topic that will shock and sadden young people, but is extremely necessary to discuss. Can you tell us more about the reasons for your creation of this commission and your work for the commission? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're right, it is really difficult topic to discuss and it is really shocking and saddening. Um, but it's a really important thing for us to talk about and for us to understand um, because this is about our history as Canada and about a lot of what's continuing to go on. So um, I was appointed, that's what it's called, the four of us commissioners, Commissioner Marion Buller was our chief commissioner, Brian Aelson, Michelle Odette and myself, we were appointed. So we were given the job by the government. So the federal government, but then also every province and every territory. They collectively gave us this job and it was like an investigation. An inquiry is like an investigation, but not like a criminal investigation. We were trying to understand the root causes of the violence indigenous women and girls and two spirit and gender diverse people experience in Canada. Um, the reason why it's so important, to, it was so important to do this work is because we were, Canada was starting to realize um, after years and years of the families of the women and girls who had gone missing or had been murdered, that this was a big problem, that this was something that um, was happening and it wasn't, I don't wanna say normal because violence is never normal and it's never okay. But for indigenous women, it was higher than the violence other non-indigenous people were experiencing. And then there was other things that women, indigenous women and girls that were experiencing and having, um, that were being subjected to that was, that didn't make sense, right? So indigenous women were making up more of the prison population, but they make up 2% of the Canadian population, but make up 40% of the jail population. What's going on there? Make up 2% of the Canadian population, but make up 30% plus of the, the cases of violence. So, we all know that indigenous women aren't the problem. You know, there's nothing about indigenous women. They're not criminals and they're not, you know, going out there saying, be violent towards me. So what's going on in our society that is creating this reality? So that was the work that we were asked to do. The reason why it's so important to discuss it is because we are a country where we value human rights where we value freedom, where we value safety and security. And if there is a part of our population that is suffering, we have to do something about it. And we have to understand why it's happening. Um, I'm about to go into your next question. So I'm gonna stop at that and let you ask it before I start going into the findings and things like that. I'm not gonna steal your thunder. <laughs> Um, just before I start, I want to say my question is four questions in, in one question combined. Um, is the commission still going on? When were the findings released? Do you feel like it served a purpose? And is there anything we can do to help hold our country accountable and help implement the, the commission's findings? That is a phenomenal set of questions. So the commission is, is done, like our work is done. We had, I think, two and a half, three years to do our work. And where are my books? We produced a report on June 3rd, 2019. Um, so 
So in our report, we, we, we studied and came, tried to understand the root causes of the violence. And then on June 3rd, we presented our reports to all the governments. So we handed it over Judge Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, we also um, presented it to all of the provinces uh, and the territories. And um, we have a number of findings, what we came to understand were the root causes. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those findings before I go into to your other questions. Really, I think fundamentally, when we look at, um, sorry, let me close that. When you look, we look at this question, what are the root causes? And root causes means like really why? Why is this happening, right? Um, so, you know, we know violence. Why is violence happening? But why is violence happening for Indigenous women? And really, the root cause of the violence that, that, that Indigenous women are subjected to is how our country was set up. Um, the legacy of colonialism, uh, colonial ideas. Um, and have you guys studied colonialism? Do you want me to unpack what that means a little bit? Yeah, so colonialism was this idea um, that indigenous people were not people that they didn't have societies and laws and government and education and health and these sophisticated societies. So when England and France came over to the lands to, to, to North America, based on ideas that um, like the doctrine of discovery, that if the people on the land weren't sophisticated, weren't Christian, weren't white for lack of, more sophisticated language on my part, that the land was free to take. It was free for British and French and other empires to take. Now, that was a faulty idea, right? Like this idea that indigenous people, and it's not just indigenous peoples in Canada, it's in North America, South America, um, Africa, um, Asia, there was this huge effort by predominantly European countries to go and claim land and, and get the riches from the land. And the people were not respected as the owners of the land. They weren't respected as communities, as nations, as families, um, and as, as individuals, as human beings, right? Fundamental human beings with equal rights and, and equal humanity. So Canada basically started with these ideas. And these ideas, although us today, we may not believe it, a lot of our institutions like our government, policing, our courts, even our schools, because they started from those ideas, a lot of those ideas are still stuck in the things we learn about, in the laws that we have, the policies that we have, the way we think and do things. We unconsciously continue to reinforce, like lift up these racist, sexist um, um, ideas that were the foundation of colonialism. And that's really the cause of the violence is that dehumanization of indigenous peoples since these lands were colonized. Um, and it's very clear from the history, residential school, um, 60s scoop, um, there's a number of other things that have happened that our government has done that have been designed to destroy indigenous communities, nations, and in many cases to actually physically harm and destroy indigenous peoples and their bodies, right? Taking, 
kids away from their mom and their dad and their community. That takes away their language. That takes away their culture. That takes away love. That takes away all the things that we need to grow and be happy kids and adults. So there's been a lot of trauma that has been caused by those years and years and years of rights violations. Um, and that trauma and that breaking down of indigenous communities and indigenous governance systems and uh, institutions um, in the name of colonialism is why we have the situation we have today. There is, um, with those findings, we gave the government what we call our calls to justice. And we have 231 calls to justice that are designed to lift up and respect human rights. The issue here is the rights, indigenous rights and human rights. And to put it in the simplest terms, governments have to and we as a society the way that we can address the violence is to work in a way that's decolonizing we have to actively get rid of these ways of thinking that are rooted in racism and sexism that don't allow our systems to see an indigenous woman or indigenous girl or indigenous two-spirit person and this also goes for people of color as human and equal and, and that upholds their dignities. So a lot, almost all of our calls for justice are about the ways that our government and our institutions can do that better. And to do that in a way that respects and upholds rights and human rights. Um, I'm look, going through your questions. I wanna make sure I don't miss anything. I'm getting over a cold, so I'm, I'm sorry if <laughs> the tissues are going to come out. Um, so holding the government accountable. Yes, 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 and yes. So there's two things. We have to do our learning. We have to read and we have to talk and we have to understand what's going on. Indigenous peoples are our best teachers, but they cannot bear that burden. There's a lot of resources like our report, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which is a little bit older, but it still has really important information in it. There are elders that wanna teach, but we have to do that work of doing the reading and doing the learning. Indigenous people have been teaching non-Indigenous people to not be racist, for a really long time. And it's not fair for people to say, to have to say over and over, please treat me as a human being. We are the ones that have to unlearn those, those ways of thinking. We have to unlearn our, our prejudices, unconscious or conscious. We have to unlearn our racism, our biases, our prejudices and our sexism. We have to do that work. So learning, learning is something that you can do um, to hold yourself accountable and others. Because I'm sure you're going to have conversations with people, sometimes older people, who are going to say things that just don't sound right and feel right. And in those times, you have an opportunity to say, that is not cool. That is, you know, that is racist, or that is prejudicial, or that is a bias and, and to challenge. So challenge yourself, challenge other people. It doesn't have to be a fight. It's, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but these are the uncomfortable conversations we have to have if we are gonna grow as a nation to be the truly just place that often we go to other countries and say, do things our way because we're awesome. Canada's awesome, but we are failing. Uh, and we are really failing Indigenous women and children. So have those conversations. You guys aren't voting yet, but you will one day. And But your voices still count. 
and you can write letters as a class. You know, you could write to Minister Miller, who is now the Minister of Indigenous uh, Crown Indigenous Relations, and you can ask him, Minister Miller, what are you doing to implement the 231 calls for justice? We would like to know. It's important to us. You guys are the future of this country, and the more you engage, you know, the more you, people will listen to you, people will hear. You can write to your school board and you say, you know what, in social studies, we're not learning enough about Indigenous peoples. Why? We would like to learn more. So you can use your voice to lift up the voices, particularly of the families and survivors, to advance them. Um, have your parents write letters. Um, when it comes to elections, ask your parents, who's the candidate who's taking Indigenous rights seriously? That's an important issue to me. So those are things that we can do, that you can do. Me as a lawyer, uh, in my work now, I work with clients who are actively advocating on the international stage, as well as here in Canada, to, to uh, fight for the implementation of the calls for justice. Um, so there's, there's the roles that we have as adults um, in the different jobs we have, we all have an opportunity to, to advance the cause for justice and advance um, justice and healing and true reconciliation. Um, do I feel it has served a purpose? I do. Um, is it moving fast enough? No, um, but I think that the inquiry was a really important step because the history and the truths that were shared by the families and survivors is now part of Canada's history. It can't ever be erased. We heard from hundreds of thousands of families and survivors that talked about their experiences with violence, with um, different institutions that have violated their, their fundamental human rights. But we also heard, sorry, we also heard about the solutions and the hopes and the dreams for the way forward. And they're in the report now. And that's something that can't be erased. You know, once the truth is out, it's, it's, it's near impossible to erase it. And I also do believe that, um, you know, there's more and more people who are recognizing their role and responsibility, taking the time to learn like you guys are doing, and that's worth so much. Because imagine if all of us still knew nothing. That would be worse than just us knowing more and doing more. All the little steps are going to count for something really, really, really big. For my sons, my grandkids, your kids, the next generations. Um, and that is going to be better for all of us. Canada will be better for all of us if human rights uh, are respected for all equally and equitably. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you so much for those insightful answers. Um, our next set of um, questions is from Nicole Simone Monet. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and my question is What ultimate goal would you like Canada, both government and citizens, to achieve with respect to First Nations? That's a great question. So, you know, I think um, the, the, the ultimate goal is respecting and upholding Indigenous rights and human rights the right to safety, the right to security, the right to clean drinking water, the right to shelter a home. Um, I think also cultural rights, the rights to speak your language, to learn in your language. Um, the right to self-determination is also a really, really big one for Indigenous peoples um, because the, the right to sort of decide your education system to decide how generations are taught and brought up and how you govern yourself, those have really been taken away. So the ultimate goal 
is for indigenous peoples to, to have their rights respected and, and um, enjoy them, right? Because a right, if a right is like on a piece of paper legislation, like we have the constitution, if those rights aren't respected, it's just a piece of paper. Like it's no difference than this box of tissues. We have to actively as citizens respect and uphold each other's rights, right? Like, I think you have a really good example right now on your face. You're wearing a mask. That's part of your right to go to school, but also your responsibility to your peers, right? To prevent illness. So respecting each other's rights is this balancing, is this respect, and it's this thoughtful sharing of space. So you're doing that in your class right now, taking those different steps with your mask. That's just one example, but we have to do that as a nation. So uh, respecting that indigenous peoples are gonna make the decisions about their land, right? Um, about their laws and their cultures, and that's their right to do so. Um, so that's to me is the ultimate goal. I also think that even above that, the ultimate goal is for Indigenous women and girls and all Indigenous peoples, as well as all Canadians, to live with dignity, to live free and with dignity. And to me, that's the ultimate goal. Thank you for your question. We have another question coming right up. What was the thing that touched you the most when you were acclaimed children advisor and something that came out of this experience? Yeah, so I loved my work at the Specific Claims Tribunal. Um, so the Specific Claims Tribunal is a special court where um, claims that Indigenous people, First Nations mostly, have against Canada are, are argued and decided. So um, over the last 150 plus odd years, um, the government has taken, stolen a lot of Indigenous land. So there was land set aside for Indigenous people for First Nations, these are called reserves. But then over the years, the government has unlawfully taken more land. So they took land, gave land, and then continued to take land, which was uh, illegal, unlawful. So there's lots and lots of claims like that. There's some in Quebec, there's some in um, BC, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta. And um, so this is a special court that he hears those types of cases and makes decisions about them. So these are really complicated legal issues and they're legal issues that most courts don't deal with a lot. So the tribunal has, they're called specialized judges, judges who this is the kind of work that they do all the time. I think what I was touched most about the specific claims tribunal um, was uh, the way the tribunal uh, worked to um, incorporate Indigenous laws. Um, usually courts are very, very strict. You have these very specific rules that you have to follow. But the chief judge of the Specific Claims Tribunal, uh, Justice Slade, um, along with guidance from the Assembly of First Nations and um, uh, other other indigenous peoples really worked to be um, inclusive and really focused on making sure that these claims were heard in the community. So I got to travel to a lot of First Nations, remote First Nations in Canada, and wherever we went, there was there was ceremony. We had the court proceedings, the tribunal proceedings, but the the community. Um, had their own proceedings that we also respected and followed. So um, I'm not going to give too much detail, but there were different types of like water ceremonies in some areas uh, were very important. Um, pipe ceremonies, sacred fires, um, 
And that was a really, really important part of the tribunal work. It's the most important thing when you're when you're trying to understand complicated history and and trying to come to to truth, it's a very sacred process. Um, um, and uh, there's a solemnity there. There's like a, 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 a like a focus, like an important there's an importance that you have to recognize and um and that was a really really that touched me a lot and being welcomed in all the different communities and meeting elders who who had the oral history to share with us about what had happened and to to bear witness to what they had to say um to these these stories and these this history that went back many, many years, but that were really uh, a profound hurt for the people and the community. And part of the healing that came from being able to share um, and hear and be heard what, what those were, I think was, was pretty powerful. That touched me. Um, but it also taught me that, you know, the, the, the Euro Canadian legal system and the way we do things, they're not the only way to do things. You can get to truth and justice in different ways. And that was really beautiful to see. Okay, thank you so much. Now, our last question is from Ecole Alvin Buckwood School. Saskatoon. You got it. Kanui <laughs> Ah, Okay, this is Emma, my student. Hi, Emma. Um, nice and loud. We have been studying colonialism in Americas and around the world and its lasting effects to this day. You have already kind of talked about this, but what advice would you give to young Canadians who want to fight for Can Canada united with Inuit, Métis, and First Nations? Yeah, that's an awesome question. You know, I think we have to learn, right? Like we have to understand what colonialism was and what it what it what it looked like, but also what it continues to look like. Um, we can't, it's not a thing of the past. It's something that still goes on um, today. Um, you know, I'll give you one example. Um, it, you know, if you look at the laws of Canada, um, nowhere in the laws of Canada are Inuit laws respected and recognized. Um, and you often see courts respecting or, or, or not respecting Inuit law. So there's still this idea that non-Indigenous ways of thinking and doing are better, right? Or more valid or have more power. So there's that that we have to recognize. That's that's because of colonialism. So as young Canadians, you really have to educate yourself. If you want to work in unity with Indigenous peoples, I think that one of the most important steps that we have to do as non-Indigenous people, and I'm a non-Indigenous person too, is we have to know when we are being oppressive and that's that's like we have to look in the mirror and go what am i doing what is my community doing to continue um colonialism and the legacy of colonialism how am i or my community or the work that i'm doing is it oppressive is it silencing indigenous people um, it's very, there's, there's concern right now. Everybody wants to do the right thing, but sometimes when we, when we want to help people, we come in and we take over. We go, I'm going to help you and I'm going to do it for you, or I'm going to fix it. And um, we see that in Canada and we see that across the world. We go to countries where, you know, maybe there are hardships or there's different challenges and 
us in North America, especially non-Indigenous people, we're like, we'll go and we'll build that school and we'll give you our government system and, and we'll help you, but on condition, you do it our way. And that's, that's colonialism dressed up as charity. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. So we have to take the leadership of Indigenous peoples. Self-determination is a really important thing. So on the path to reconciliation, where the goal is equity and self-determination of Indigenous peoples, we have to listen and learn and take leadership from them. So if there are... Um, you know, different First Nations in your communities, so Saskatoon, who's got a beardy Sinokimasis who's close uh, to Saskatoon, you know, learning what the priorities are for, for the community near you. What are their priorities? What is their goal for them? What does reconciliation look like for them? Um, what does, what do they need from you? And that's, I think, a really important thing to do. Have a relationship with the Indigenous people in your community, an honest one where you're listening and learning and taking their leadership. Um, and it'll look different. You know, in BC, the communities will be different. In, in Montreal, you've got Ganawagi, you've got Oka, you have the, um, um, there are also Inuit and Cree in in your region, uh, in Montreal, you know, it's building relationships with those communities in understanding what their priorities are um, and taking the leadership from them, the direction from them. But in the meantime, I think the most important thing young Canadians can do is to read and to learn and to advocate. Advocate for anti-racism, advocate for equality, equity, justice, advocate for indigenous rights and human rights, demand that your governments and your institutions respect them. And in your schools, if your teachers aren't teaching you about racism and colonialism, they're not doing you any favors because it's out there. Just because they don't teach it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So you can demand it. My son ends up having to do that. He probably hates me, but <laughs> whenever material comes home and it's not the big picture, I go, what's, what about this? What about that? And we do our own work. And then he goes back to class and he said, you know what? I did some research about this, you know, period of time in the history of the province. You know, what about this issue? What about indigenous peoples? What about, you know, so there's a lot you can do and learning is a really, really powerful tool. And I think you might've met with Justice Sinclair, Murray Sinclair, and I know he and the TRC have talked about how important learning is. And, and I echo what he says on that front for sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> now I will hand it over to Clive. Thank you so much, uh, Kaya, for taking the time this morning with us to answer our questions. Um, this was a very powerful interview um, for us, different than many of the other interviews he's done, but um, really um, brings together and just, again, stresses the importance for us and our young people um, to be aware uh, of um, what's happening to our First Nations people. And we're committed um, in Canada here um, to truth and reconciliation, and especially for us who work in Catholic schools, um, that's very near and dear to our hearts. So uh, thank you to, uh, for sharing all of your um, knowledge, your wisdom, and the work that you've done with Indigenous peoples. Um, before um, Davinia closes and thanks you, I just wanted to um, extend to you um, an invitation just for a final uh, closing statement or just a final message to our youth. Yeah, I, you know, I think this is um, a really powerful week. Um, and uh, particularly with the Indigenous delegates meeting with the Pope this week. Um, and having this discussion uh, about the path forward with, with the Pope and with the leaders within the Catholic Church. Um, 
there's so much more that needs to be done, but I think that um, it is a really important uh, step to meet, to sit together, to talk together, to listen and learn. Um, and, you know, I have, um, the Catholic Church has a lot of work to do, and, and I really do hope that the Pope is listening um, to, to the Indigenous leaders and delegates that are there, uh, sharing with him. But, you know, I, I have to admit that um, I have a tremendous amount of hope sitting here with you guys, because you are the future leaders, you know. And perhaps the Pope, this is going to be some of the first times he's heard about these things and learned about these things. But it's not the first time for you guys, and it's not the last time for you guys. And I trust that you're going to share what you've learned. You're going to hold it in your heart and in your minds. And, and it's going to help shape how you walk in this world and how you treat people. Um, always with love and dignity and re respect and honoring each humanity. We are all humans. And that is something that we have to protect and cherish and love. So a lot of work to continue to do, but um, I have faith in you guys. So thank you. Thank you for listening to me and, and asking such awesome questions. I've met with law students who don't have as good questions as you guys. So um, awesome preparation. So um, Kaya, I first want to say on behalf of all of us at Young Google Citizens, it's been a pleasure having you. And thank you for taking the time out to share with us in-depth information, insightful experiences. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Um, your answers, um, I'm sure, taught all um, her students something definitely taught me and uh, thank you for being so open we truly appreciate it Bum, ba da, 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 da,